Well, hello everyone. My name is Elena G. Levine and I'm president of Quantum Success Solutions and author of the book Networking for Nerds. So today we're going to talk about how to bounce back from a career challenge. And I got to be honest with you, I have personally dealt with many career challenges in my life. And when I think back about how I actually managed those challenges, how I moved past those challenges, and what I learned from those challenges, there were some very specific universal elements that were universal across all the different types of challenges that I faced uh, and were useful for me as I was able to learn the lesson from each challenge to be able to meet the next challenge with even better uh, grit, with even better talent, with even better um, mechanisms so that I can quickly understand what the challenge is doing to me and to the system that I'm operating in and also understand how I can move past the challenge. It's very, very important, and I just want to say this right from the start, that with challenges, it, the biggest challenge that people have when facing challenges, in particular career challenges, it's actually two things. Number one, they forget who they are. And number two, they forget the facts of themselves and of the system in which they're operating. And we're going to talk about how to handle those things, but I just wanted you to know right from the start that most people, when they deal with challenges, they forget the facts of who they are, what the system is, and as a result, they lose themselves in the challenge and they forget who they are and what they've done. They become part of the challenge as opposed to a human that's engaged in the challenge. So we're going to talk about that, but I just wanted to give that to you straight up from the top so you can start thinking about that. So what we're going to be doing today is I'm going to be talking about a couple of different types of challenges and how to work through and move beyond those challenges. And I'm going to give you a universal game plan that you can actually use for any type of challenge, which I think will be useful for you. And then we're going to learn how to plan in advance for any potential career challenge and how to embrace and learn from every type of career challenge. Now, the typical challenges that I encounter with myself and also with my clients and my students and the people that I interact with are those that you see in front of you. And what we're going to do today is we're actually going to discuss the different types of, uh, we're going to actually use um, the uh, we're going to use two case studies, the zombie boss and the two-body challenge, as our way of working through any type of challenge. But the typical challenges that I find that people interact have that they face um, include the zombie boss, which I will go into detail about, the two-body challenge, right, when you have two people who are in a couple, uh, two partners, and they often have two very high-level educations, very high-level degrees, and they're trying to find jobs and careers in the same region, the same city, and perhaps even at the same institution. So how do you handle that? We're going to walk, I'm going to walk you through that. And of course, other types of challenges that you may face in your life could potentially include a layoff or a firing. I personally have been laid off, and to me, that challenge actually helped me to start to see what else I could do in my life that could strengthen, that could actually fortify my skills so that when I deal with other challenges, Challenges, both high stake challenges and low stake challenges in my career, I can embrace it and I can make sure that I separate myself from that challenge as I've mentioned and also pursue it in such a way that I feel successful even if it's not the way I would have liked. Nobody wants to be laid off, nobody wants to be fired necessarily, but there are things that you can do to ensure your mental health and to ensure that your um, emotional health and your ability to see yourself for your true self remains intact. Uh, other types of challenges that you may face include dealing with an ineffective work environment. It could be that the system that what you're in which you're operating is toxic or it could be something as simple as you're working on a project, you need a specific tool or instrument and your employer or your team is not able to get access to that tool or that instrument or is not providing you with the resources you need to be successful. So it's an ineffective environment. But you also might find that you're not valued in your organization. There could be changes that you have in your life that change your value system or priorities, which allows you to then look at your system a little bit differently. And then as a result, you are now faced with a challenge because suddenly your priorities priorities and your value system is not in line with that of your employer. And maybe it was before, but because, your change, because you've had this change, 
it's no longer in line, which means you now have a challenge ahead of you. Do you need to do you want to stay? Do you need to stay? Can you leave? There are things to be asked about that. You might find that you're not challenged enough at work, honestly, or you're given assignments that just don't match your skill set. So these are some of the, the typical challenges that we find. So as I mentioned, the challenge in dealing with challenges is to remember the facts, who you are. We often find as we're dealing with a challenge, particularly with a zombie boss, and you know we're hearing a lot about this in the news, right? I mean, in the news recently, of course, there's a lot of discussion about uh, harassment right now all over the United States and across the world. I mean, it's nothing new. And so we're hearing about people who have been harassed and them coming forward. And what I've found is that when you're dealing with this type of a challenge is you really have to remember who you are, that you are not the uh, fronting party. You are not the person who is doing the harassing and you are not the harassment. You are not the challenge. You are yourself. You have to remember who you are, the type of person you are, that you are go-getter, that you are a, a person who has high values, who has a high moral code, the type of professional you are, the types of things that you've done the values that you have, um, what you've accomplished. This is always a great thing to do. And let me tell you, what you should do is when you're faced with any challenge, is go and that day, go home and look at your resume. Go home and look at your LinkedIn profile. Go home and remember all of the s seemingly small, quote unquote, small projects that you might have been involved in in the course of your career, even if it's a short career, even if you haven't been in the work world for a very long time, the early career professional students even, remember what you've done. Remember how talented you are and look at the physical evidence of that on your resume or on the list of projects or programs that you've been involved in so you can actually see the evidence. I want you to see the data that is evidence of the facts of who you are. When we're dealing with challenge, it takes a few things. So I want to walk you through this. So number one, it takes courage and it takes guts. It takes courage to be able to say, this is something that is wrong, or there's something, there's something, there's a perturbation here in this system that I'm not necessarily satisfied with. It takes courage to stand up to a challenge and say, you know what, I don't think I like this. I want to try something different. And that challenge could be positive and negative in nature. I mean, it takes courage to be able to say, you know what, I'm not happy in my career. Even though I'm valued in my job, even though my boss is a fantastic professional and has really been a, a true mentor to me, this is not where I belong. I am not happy here. That takes courage and guts to be able to do that. And it takes courage and guts, of course, to stand up to somebody who is negative or to stand up to a negative scenario, to emerge in a positive light, to emerge from a firing or a layoff or a zombie boss in a positive way. It takes strength. It takes strength on your part, not the other person's part, not the other party's part, not the other system's part, but your part to do the right thing for you and for the system and for your benefit as you move forward in your career. It takes clear communication, clear communication with potentially your team, clear communication with your partner and your family, and most importantly, clear communication with yourself, which involves honesty, being honest about yourself and with yourself about what's happening in front of you, what is going on in the environment that has changed, what are your goals, what, what can we do about this to move forward from this. It takes planning to deal with challenges, and that's one of the things we're going to do today with this webinar is I want to actually give you a plan, a universal plan that will help you to deal with any type of career challenge you in, in face, whether it's a negative, a seemingly negative challenge or a seemingly positive challenge. And you know me, you know me, of course, so you know I'm all about the networking, networking for nerds, networking for everybody. So dealing with challenge does take networking. It takes networking in the past, it takes networking in the present while you're dealing with the challenge, and it'll take networking in the future to resolve the challenge and to move forward from the challenge. So it's very important for you to continue your networking and to really do your networking in advance and keep those strong networks ready to go so that if there is a challenge, you can call upon those people in your networks networks so that they can potentially help you with that challenge. Um, it also takes a willingness to see the bigger picture for yourself and possibly for your organization and your team and, and an appreciation honestly for the challenge and what it's going to teach you and this is this is challenging oh my goodness if you're in the middle of a layoff and um, you want to think well I am so appreciative that I no longer have a job that is a challenge to say that but I can tell you that from my own perspective and when I have dealt with this type of a challenge in retrospect 
I saw that this challenge, this layoff, actually positioned me in the right place mentally and physically and in my career so that I could start thinking about other things that I could do that would bring me intellectual pleasure and would provide me with the necessary intellectual stimulation that would allow me to be have an enjoyable life, have an enjoyable career. That's tough to do when you're in the middle of it. When they walk you down the when they walk down the hall and say you're being laid off or you're being fired, that's not exactly the easiest thing to say. Thank you. I am so appreciative of this layoff. I am appreciative of the universe for this layoff. I get it. It's not that easy. But I just want you to be aware that if you can start thinking about appreciating the challenge, then what happens is when you do face a challenge, you can say, aha, this is a challenge. But it's a challenge that I am going to appreciate because I have the skills to face this challenge. I think a lot about this when I'm running. So I'm a runner and I run up hills. I live in Tucson, Arizona, as many of you know, and I'm constantly running up hills. And when I'm running up hills and it is annoying and it is hard, I say to myself, I am thankful for this hill. I am thankful for this hill because with every step that I take running or walking or crawling sometimes up this hill, every step is a gift that I'm giving to myself to be able to meet an even greater challenge down the road. That's the way I think. And I want you to be able to think like that too. Now, of course, dealing with challenge also takes negotiation skills. It takes negotiation with yourself, with the system, with the parties involved, and possibly even with your family as you move forward and pass this challenge. It also includes and re requires that you have recognition of certain types of behavior and attitudes and actions, <coughs> excuse me, of other people. Excuse me just a second. <coughs> Um, recognition of other people of what they should and should not be doing, what is appropriate and not appropriate. Excuse me, I'm going to cough, so hold on just. Okay, sorry about that. Uh, talking about what's appropriate, it's most appropriate for me to mute while I'm coughing your ear off. But what's appropriate and not appropriate for a person to do in a particular scenario, and also recognition of what you perceive is an unsafe or an uncomfortable situation and what your gut says about the above. We have a habit also within challenges, while we're knee deep in the challenge, to second guess ourselves. And let me give you an example. Um, recently I was talking to a young woman, a young uh, scientist at a conference, and she came up to me and she said, Elena, I want to ask you your opinion about a scenario that happened over the course of this conference. So she gave her poster and uh, a senior member of the community, of a scientist uh, within her field, came up and uh, started talking to her at her poster and was being very pleasant and professional and appropriate in his comments. And they were having a very really nice conversation about the work that she had been doing. And they exchanged contact information. And he texted her, uh, I think, later that day to say, it was so nice to meet you at the conference uh, at, the, at your poster. And she texted him back. And then he said, uh, maybe we can meet while we're at the conference. Maybe we can meet for lunch. And so she said, sure. She assumed that this was all on the up and up. It, he was still behaving very professionally. So they met for lunch, and then when they were at lunch, I think he said, why don't we meet for dinner? And she said, no, I, I can't meet for dinner because I'm going to this mixer. Uh, and then what happened was he showed up at the mixer, and it was not a mixer in his subfield, so it wasn't really exactly the kind of thing that you'd expect this professional, quote-unquote, to show up at. But he showed up at the mixer and then he followed her around in the mixer and she began to realize that there was something wrong with this equation. Uh, she, she was second guessing herself at the beginning. Uh, she was thinking maybe this is a professional, yes he's texting me a couple of times, a little bit more than usual for somebody who's meeting me for the first time who's in a senior role in this uh, field, in this uh, profession. You know, maybe it's just me. That's what she was thinking. And when he showed up at this mixer and started following around and then continued to text her after that, and then I think even at the mixer or maybe at another event later on in the week at the same conference, he is standing near her and he puts his hand on her shoulder. And, you know, she was, she asked me later, she said, what, what should I have done? What could I have done to, to, to show him that I'm not I don't, I'm not interested in that, that I'm being professional here, uh, that I want to remove his hand from my shoulder. And I said, you know, you don't second guess yourself. If your gut tells you that something is strange, if something is a challenge, if something is not right, you don't second guess yourself. 
and you can remove yourself from that equation in any way that you personally see fit. You have the right and you have the choice. But the thing is, is that most people, they don't think about that. They think that they want to be polite. They want to keep the relationship. They, maybe they're second guessing it. Maybe this person is not toxic. And therefore, they, they don't, uh, they, they second guess themselves. And what I don't want you to do is I don't want you to second guess yourself. I want you to stay in the moment and stay in who you are. This doesn't feel right. Therefore, this is not right. Therefore, I will do what I feel is appropriate to remove myself from the equation. Follow your gut. Very, very important. Really want you to think about that. Um, so that includes, of course, since we're following our gut, it includes that we have to have an appreciation for ourselves, that we will do the right thing for ourselves at the moment. And I have to give myself a break because in hindsight, it might be that I should have done X or I should have done Y or it, you know, we're dealing with a two body challenge that perhaps if we had started earlier, we could have done better or if we had negotiated, we could have gotten more. Give yourself a break. In that moment in time and space, you did the right thing at the right moment. And you are adaptive, you are adaptable, you are flexible and you know what, things change. You did the right thing that you felt. You did what you felt was the right thing at that moment. So give yourself a break. Now, the final thing about dealing with challenges, and this is sort of an overarching idea that I want you to be thinking about, uh, is the idea that particularly people who have a science and engineering background, you are actually given the advantage. You actually have an advantage, interestingly enough, in dealing with challenges because you know what? a challenge, dealing with a challenge is, you know what it actually is? It's actually data science. It's data science. It involves data collection, mining, processing, and understanding and learning from the data. The data collection that we're doing is the data on ourselves, the data on the system, the data on potentially other parties within the system and how they're interacting with us. It involves processing that data so that we can understand what we can gain from that information and then ultimately gaining a lesson from that collection, from that data collection and from that data processing. What does the data tell us? And who better to handle this type of data science than somebody who has a scientist and engineer, science and engineering background? So you actually have an advantage in dealing with challenges. So now here's your plan, okay? The best way to handle any challenge, no matter what kind of challenge it is, okay? Even a good challenge, like I just got five job offers from five different companies that I want to work for, as well as five new faculty offers to be a faculty a professor at different five years different universities. So I have 10 job offers on the table. Woe is me. What am I going to do? Oh my goodness. Here's how you handle this challenge. Here's how, to, how you handle this challenge or any other challenge. You build an advanced emergency contingency plan and you complete this plan well in advance of taking any job or pursuing any career opportunity of any sort. And it starts with data collection, of course, knowing all of your career options with your skills, your experience, your expertise, knowing where you could potentially go in and out of your field and within and without traditional pathways within your field, and also your career options in and out of the particular geographic region that you're operating in right now. And of course, it involves networking, right? Continuous networking and actively engaging mentors. This is what we want to be thinking about. If you do this type of plan, if you have this simple plan, it's a very simple plan, and I'm going to give you some more pieces of the plan in a few moments. If you build this, this umbrella plan for yourself where you know what your options are, you know how to access those options, you have mentors who are in your corner who want to help you, you know for a fact that they want to help you, you have people across your networks across the world, potentially on other planets, on other exoplanets, galaxies and universes who can potentially help you, this is going to be the best thing for you so that if you are laid off, you can contact these people. That's what I did when I was laid off. I immediately contacted my, my networks. I, I wrote emails to many, many different people on my network so that they would know where I was, what was happening, and also in a positive way that they would know that I was available to work with them now that I was no longer working for this, this, uh, this organization. So the networking really comes in handy. And, and I went back to my resume and I looked back at my resume and I saw all the things that I had done and I was reminded that even though I'm saddened by the layoff and I'm upset emotionally by the layoff, I have the facts in front of me. The facts are that I am an amazing employee, that I did really good work, that I did these types of problems, solved these types of problems, did these types of projects. 
I saw that and it actually served almost like a security blanket so that I can work my way through the challenge of the layoff and not be as upset. And the upsetness is really important because we don't want to be burdened by our emotions when we're trying to deal with a physical scenario in front of us, right? And the challenge is the physical scenario. And, uh, you know, if it's a zombie boss, if it's a two-body challenge, if it's taking a new opportunity, if it's a layoff, we can potentially be clouded by our emotions, particularly our negative emotions, but also our positive emotions too, if it's a happy environment. And so we have to take a moment to clear ourselves of those emotions just for a few moments. And the way I found is useful to do that, not just to be mindful of it, but to actually look at the physical evidence of your successes so that you actually can remember what it is that you've done and what it is that you can do for another potential employer or another potential colleague or another potential collaborator in the future. So let's now go into two case studies uh, that are both very serious and one is escape from the zombie boss or colleague. So we're going to talk about now who is a zombie, what can they do to you, uh, why you need to get away, how you actually get away, how you actually escape. And make, make no mistake here, if you engage a zombie, you absolutely have to escape. There's no, there's no question about it. So I want to just mention here that, that when we talk about what a zombie is, a zombie is not somebody who has only the following. So if you find that you're interacting with somebody who has subpar management skills, maybe they don't know how to communicate well, maybe they have bad delegation experience or bad leadership or their supervisory capabilities are just really not as good as they could be, that doesn't necessarily mean they're a zombie. They could just be not skilled in this area. But more specifically, when, the, when you do engage a zombie, you absolutely have to escape. So why must you escape? Because no one deserves to be treated like the zombie is treating you. Do you value your work? Well, guess what? The zombie doesn't value your work. They don't value it at all. Do you crave the opportunity to be a productive scientist, engineer, professional? They don't want that. They want to see you crumble. They want to see you drop. They want to be able to take your creative energy for themselves. Do you want to advance? They don't want to see you advance. They want to see you under their thumb. That's all they want to do because the more you are within the orbit of them, the better that they will survive. Remember the zombie movies. Remember the zombie movies and how zombies behave. They don't behave logically. They don't behave logically. They behave on instinct alone. And the instinct is, I need to survive, and therefore I will eat the brains of the people who are near me so I can survive. And what's the next step? To eat more brains. And that's the kind of person, quote unquote person, that a zombie is. When you engage or interact with a zombie or find yourself interacting with a zombie in your workplace or in a collaboration, they don't want to see you advance. They don't want to see you creative. They don't want to see you do anything except stay where you are so that they can remove the creative energy that you have. They can remove your talent and use it for themselves. So let's talk a little bit about the spectrum of zombies so that you kind of get a sense of what exactly is a zombie. So I actually organize my spectrum of zombies into a couple of different categories so you can be thinking about this. And of course, I know we're near Halloween, right? So this is the perfect time to be discussing this. And interestingly, if you uh, would like more information about this, I wrote an article that is on Physics Today's website. It's also on the AIP Career Network website. It's called Beware the Zombies, Haters, Pigs, and Jerks. And I'll uh, provide you with some links at the end, but I thought you might be interested in that article, which goes into more detail about this. So who are the zombies that you might interact with? The first type of zombie, which is on the very end of the danger, danger, danger zone spectrum of zombies, is what I call the highly dangerous zombies. These are zombies who are physically, sexually, or emotionally harassing you. They are literally lunatics. They are creating an unsafe work environment. You cannot negotiate with a zombie. You can certainly not negotiate with a highly dangerous zombie. They are called highly dangerous because it is meant to scare you so that you recognize this is a highly dangerous system right here. You cannot stay. You have to leave. There's also another type of zombies continuing on the spectrum of what I call obvious zombies. These are also very dangerous. But they, while they may not physically harass you or sexually or emotionally harass you, they are harassing you in a different way. They're harassing you sort of like under the guise of a professional sort of environment. And you might not necessarily realize that they're doing it, although I think that they're somewhat obvious because they steal your work, they malign your reputation, they may insult you in front of others. 
they openly disrespect you, and they bully or intimidate you and others around you to get what they want. And make no mistake, if you see an obvious zombie or a highly dangerous zombie behaving like a zombie to another person, don't think that, oh, I'm safe, I'm safe, everything's cool. The zombies never behave that way to me. No, guess what? They don't think that way. They're looking for any available brain. If you're there, they will take your brain too. So if you see somebody doing something that is zombie-like to another person, that's a challenge that you need to face. And that challenge is that they're going to do it to me next. And I have to stand up for this person, and I have to stand up for myself and remove myself and hopefully help this other person remove themselves from the equation. Another type of zombie is what I call the creeping zombies, right? These are not necessarily obvious. They go behind your back and do any of the above. They don't ask for or take your input. They are just sort of creeping around. They're very sly. They're very sneaky. They have a very nice way of doing things, nice quote-unquote, and that people think that they're such a sweetheart, and then in the background they're doing this. So they're the bully, the obvious zombies that are doing this openly, screaming in the lab, for example. And then there are the creeping zombies who are very pleasant and yet are maligning you, are harassing you. There's another type of zombie that I call the All About Eve zombie, and that's based, that title is based on a movie called All About Eve, which uh, uh, was about basically somebody who got into a career, got into a job scenario, into a work environment, and looked to supplant that person. And All About Eve zombies are usually creeping zombies. They're dangerous too, but they're creeping in that they're very sneaky but they're looking to not just eat your brain, but to actually supplant you in the system. And then the very other end of the zombie spectrum is what I call the non-zombies, and these are just super jerks, okay? They're not necessarily uh, out to eat your brain, but I put them on the spectrum of zombies just because they are jerks. They could be potentially super jerks. It's possible you could still work with them, uh, but the chances are you probably can't. So it's just something to be, to be aware of. These are people, and they tend to be more human than zombies do. They disregard your work, they don't ask for your input, and they, they generally just don't help you as a mentor or as a colleague should. And they're, they're just being very jerky. So when is escape necessary? When the zombies' actions make you feel unsafe or make others feel unsafe? are currently ruining or will ruin your reputation and your brand, which of course is your promise of value, and are preventing or will prevent you from advancing in your career. Um, you can't negotiate with a zombie. You can't logically deal with a zombie. You have to escape. Um, but I also recognize that the question of when to escape from a zombie, is the answer is as soon as possible with an asterisk because there are caveats of different issues which includes your physical and mental safety, it includes the system that you're in, it includes economics, you know, whether or not you have the financial backing to be able to move quickly out of this particular role that you're in or this job or this organization, it includes family decisions, it includes your living situation, it could even include geographic concerns. So I, I bring this up to you so that you just be aware that if you can escape as soon as possible that's best to deal with this challenge, but I also want you to be aware of these other issues and to see if you can address them. The realities of escaping from a zombie boss, let's be honest here, it might be that you have to switch institutions, it might be that you have to switch fields, it might be that you have to switch industries altogether, that you have to uh, leave a particular uh, industry altogether. And some of you have heard me discuss uh, when I was a, an undergraduate student I was very interested in going to graduate school for a particular area of mathematical history. That was something I was very interested in. And I, uh, the University of Arizona, where I went to the school, where I went to school, they knew, uh, the department knew that I was very interested in this mathematical history subject. And um, when the chief guy, the doctor god of that area, that sub-sub-field of mathematical history, was coming to the university to give a colloquium, I was invited by the department. They said, hey, guess what? We know you're interested in working with Dr. God in grad school, and he's coming to give a colloquium. We'd like to invite you to the colloquium and the after party. And I was so excited to meet him, and I heard his speech, and it was fantastic. And then I uh, went up to meet him at the uh, after party, and uh, there, in the presence, I was about 22 years old, in the presence of about five or six other uh, leading, uh, leading um, uh, established professionals in this field, 
uh, somebody introduced me to uh, Dr. God and Dr. God turned around to me and immediately said something racist to me about me and and I was shocked I was shocked and I was so upset and I crumbled I mean I remember physically feeling almost like I crumbled in person uh, physically because I just could not believe that somebody would be so hurtful so disgusting be such a zombie and and a jerk and and right at that moment and in front of seven or whatever number of people that were there and nobody said anything nobody said anything I excused myself and left and I realized that I was not going to be able to work with this Dr. God and because I couldn't work with this Dr. God in this area of mathematical history the chances of me working with other people in mathematical history in this subfield were going to be very slim he was the Dr. God he was the one that this entire subfield orbited around so I wasn't going to be able to work with anybody else because he was the center and in the center was a racist zombie jerk. So I decided to think about other things that I could potentially do that would make me happy and, and I eventually found my way. But the point is, is that I did end up having to, to sacrifice that area of mathematical history that I loved so much because this zombie was in the equation. And it's sad. It's very sad that I had to do that, but the reality is that that was just what had to be done at that moment. Now, could we change the system? Absolutely, we can do that. We can collectively do that, and I think that that's what's happening right now in the United States in particular, that we're actually trying to change the system in which we operate so that we don't have this type of thing where we have to leave our career dreams you know, onto the side because the industry is saturated by a zombie or is run by a zombie or a series of zombies. But the reality is, is that at the moment, that's still not a complete option to not necessarily leave the industry. So you may have to switch industries, you may have to switch fields, but the idea is that this might be a good thing and we're going to embrace that as much as possible. So when, in our escape from the zombie, we're going to do the following things. First of all, we're going to start documenting everything that the, the zombie does and says and the effect it has on you. And I'm going to do this on, in, a, in a secret place in my home or on a device that that zombie cannot get access to. I have a, a colleague of mine who makes notes on her phone, but of course her phone is locked, so it's not something that uh, easily can be accessed. But the idea is what she started to do was she wrote down the date, the time, the location, who else was present, if anybody else saw what the zombie did, and she wrote down what did he say, what did he do, what did she do, what did she do, say. Uh, and in this case, or you know, for another case, one of my other clients, they had a zombie mentor, and the zombie mentor would insult the uh, the the young scientist poster in public. And so what she did, what the young scientist did, was she wrote down my zombie boss in front of Dr. X, Dr. Y, Dr. Z at this conference on this date insulted my public my my poster in public and as a result it's cost me a potential job lead so make sure you make a note of everything that it happened that happens in the effect and the effect that it has on you and then when you have this collection of information go to somebody that you know for a fact as opposed to your guessing but a fact that you can trust and this could be a mentor from another department institution or air industry which ideally you would have built through your networking, which is another reason why networking is so, so important and so strategic, so that we have a diversity of mentors at our disposal. And it could even be potentially the ombudsman committee that exists at your institution. And then I'm going to start researching what are my other options in this particular department, in this field. Could I, can I stay in this subfield? If I switch to another subfield, what are the ramifications? Can I stay for a period of time, is that possible? What are the other institutions? What are the other jobs in the region or in this field? What possible help can a mentor provide me? And then I'm going to start actually making, pursuing other opportunities. I'm going to start applying for other jobs. I'm going to start sending my, re my resume out in a discreet fashion. And I'm going to ask people for discretion. I'm going to say, especially to my network, I'm going to say, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm interested in leaving this organization, uh, this, this uh, particular type of, uh, this field or this subject, I want to move into another area, could you please be discreet, but I wanted to see if there's an opportunity to collaborate with you. And, and the idea is that we're trying to open doors, but we're trying to remove ourselves as quickly as we possibly can. Now, when you actually do sever the tie, for, for zombies that are not highly, highly dangerous, 
it is possible for you to actually conclude and resolve, not resolve, but I'd say conclude and finish the relationship with the, with the zombie so that you can then remove yourself and leave. And what I mean by that is if they're not highly dangerous, and I'll come back to highly dangerous in a moment, you could potentially make an appointment with them. Uh, you could even do that in the presence of the department head or somebody else. Um, you can thank them. You could you know, tell them that you're going to be moving on. You don't have to say it's because of them. Remember, zombies don't necessarily understand facts either. So it's not really going to help you in that moment when you're leaving the zombie to say, I'm leaving because you did this. You can do that if you want, but it, I've found that it doesn't necessarily help. Instead, focus on the positive. Focus on that you're moving to this other field or this other university or this other organization or this other region because you're going to be working on new challenges because you're excited to work on new things. But thank you very much for the opportunity. Shake hands and then be glad that you got away. But the reality is that's, that's useful for certain types of zombies. But for other types of zombies, the highly dangerous zombies, I do not recommend you be in their airspace and in their physical space. Definitely not by yourself, but potentially not even not even not by yourself. So um, this is something that only you will know for sure as to what type of zombie they are and whether or not it's a safe environment for you to even be in the same physical space with them uh, as you conclude and finish the relationship and move on to something else. In summary, recognize that a zombie is typically driven by non-logical uh, drivers uh, and um, some zombies are jerks, some jerks are zombies, but sometimes they don't even inter, inter, uh, uh, interface either. They could be separate types of beings. But you do have to have the courage to escape and you can build your zombie escape plan early on into your overall career challenge plan. Do it quickly, do it quietly, do it professionally because it's your reputation and it's your life. It's your safety that's at stake. Those are the highest stakes possible. This is a necessity and it can be done. You can escape the zombie boss or colleague and I highly recommend that you do that. So now we're going to switch gears a little bit as we, as we uh, migrate towards the conclusion of this webinar for today, which is in about 20 minutes or so. And now I want to talk about something that's a little bit happier, okay? And that's managing the two-body challenge. Uh, so this is something that's positive because this is a great thing that you have a partner uh, that you have a good relationship with and you and your partner are trying to build a career plan that meets both of your needs. So that's what we're trying to do here in managing this challenge. So we're going to talk about what the two-body challenge is, when and how to deal with it, assessing the needs, opportunities, realities, and contingencies, and then some negotiating tips. So, as I mentioned, we know, some of us know a little bit about the two-body challenge. Some people call it the two-body problem. I like to call it the two-body challenge. And typically what we find is it's two partners with two careers. And most often it's two partners whose, whose education levels are very high. So they both have PhDs, and they might even have PhDs in the same subject, maybe even in the same sub-sub-subfield. And so they're trying to pursue careers, and ideally they like each other, may they, they might even love each other, in which case they want to be in the same region, they want to be in the same maybe even institution, they want to live in the same domicile. And how do you make this happen? We're trying to see what we can do to pursue our careers, both of our careers, the careers of both partners, particularly in particular at the in the same location at the same time. So it's a moment in time, it's a moment in space. With the highest level of commitment, right? We don't want to sacrifice. One partner should not necessarily have to completely remove their career dreams for the other partner. That's not an equal partnership. We want an equal partnership as much as possible. Of course, some people don't want that. They don't need that out of their relationship, and that's fine too. But um, when I think about two-body challenges, I think about people, two people in a partnership that are really driven and they really want to have enjoyment out of their careers. And so we want to be realistic and see how can we actually make that happen in the same region. So we're going to make a plan. And a part of this plan in dealing with the two-body challenge is identifying both your individual needs and wants and also what your couple goals are. Now, 
we've talked in previous webinars about how to manage a career change, how to plan for individual issues, and so you can take a look at some of the other webinars I've given and you'll see how to actually build the individual plan of identifying what your needs and wants are, where you could potentially pursue careers, both in the traditional sphere of where you what you were educated in as well as non-traditional spheres. But here, what I want to focus on is how to actually think about the couple goals. And what we're trying to do is we're trying to identify opportunities that will help us both in this partnership achieve our, these particular goals, our, both our individual goals as much as possible, as well as our couple goals. So we're going to be developing our plans with goals and timelines and milestones. And of course, we're going to develop a plan B, a plan C, and a plan D. So if we are not able to find jobs in the same city, then our plan B will be to find jobs within 100 miles or 100 kilometers. Or a colleague of mine, when she and her partner were developing plans, they the second, the, the plan B or the plan C that they put into place was that they would live in between their two jobs and their jobs their two jobs were potentially in opposite ends of the uh, the, the, the space you know in the region that they were in um, and they were far away within like you know more than an hour of travel time for both of them but to meet the needs of both people in the partnership they decided to live in between so that they would both only have an hour as opposed to one partner having a two hour each way commute and one having only a few moments. So we're going to develop those contingency plans and we're going to be flexible as opportunities come across our, our dashboard and help us to see what might else be appropriate for us to pursue and we're going to be realistic. And having a plan in place with multiple plans and timelines and goals and milestones so so useful in dealing with this two-body challenge because when in doubt, when we're not sure we're making the right choice, when we want to decide once and for all, should we take these jobs? Should we pursue this opportunity? Uh, should I take this job and then you'll find another opportunity? You will have the plan in front of you. So you can go back and review the plan. You can make adjustments as necessary, but at least you have that outline which can assist you. Now, of course, within the two-body challenge, there are going to be a lot of different scenarios that are going to impact how you choose what career opportunities you want to pursue. Um, and one of those, in, which is something that I hear constantly, is the timing issue, right? That maybe we're both, me and my partner, are both graduating or finishing our graduate degree or our postdoc at the same time, which would be, in some cases, really great because then we're both on the same schedule, right? Uh, and we can both look forward as opposed to dealing with the anchor of being still associated with the university because we haven't finished yet. Um, but then the reality is that some many couples don't have that. They have one who's graduating or finishing, uh, one who's graduating and one who's in a postdoc, uh, one who's in a postdoc and one who's going for a tenure track position, one who's in a tenure track position and another one who's trying to move forward in their career in some form or fashion. Um, I remember hearing uh, Brian Schmidt talk about, Brian Schmidt is the, uh, the Vice Chancellor and President of Australian National University. Um, he's a Nobel Laureate. He wrote the foreword for my book, Networking for Nerds. And I remember him talking about how he was doing a postdoc at ANU uh, in astrophysics. And I think he had applied for a position, a faculty job at ANU multiple times and had never gotten it. And he, at the time, was married. He still is married to an economist who had a fantastic job in the region. And I think he had at least one kid and maybe a second kid on the way. And he was trying to think, well, what else can I do? Because if I'm not going to get a job here in this town, in this city in Australia, I want to stay because this is where my family is and this is what my, my, my wife is doing really, really well in her job. So I'm, I want to see what else I can potentially do. And in the end, he did get a job as a faculty member at ANU. And I think what the way he tells it is that he was like the, the third or the fourth choice for the position and they offered the position to three or four of the people they all turned it down and as a fluke they offered it to him and he said absolutely yes and that's how he got started at ANU and now he runs the entire university it's pretty extraordinary that's a great great story there was a lot of luck involved in that of course but the thing was is that he was actually thinking proactively what else can I do with my degree in astrophysics 
if I don't get a position here because the couple goals for him and his wife and his family was we wanted to stay here and and her career was was very important in that equation so they were trying to think what else they could do so it was a timing issue um, the ideal is that we have two partners with no absolutes meaning that we're very open-minded realistic and flexible in terms of what our needs and our wants are now your goals and needs and wants are over here your partners goals and needs and wants are over there and the sweet spot is where you both can find the right opportunities that would be right for you at the right time okay so now in the planning phase as, as we think about our couple goals we need to think about what we want and what we need as a couple in this partnership and remember, needs and wants are often separate. They may interface, they may overlap, but oftentimes they are separate. And ideally what we want to focus on is our needs, but we also want to be honest about what we want from our partnership as a couple. So maybe what we want as a couple in this two-body challenge is we would really love, we love working with each other. I love working with my partner. I want to work in the same institution as him or her. I want to be in the same department as him as her, and him uh, him or her. Uh, maybe I want to work want to work in the same geographic location or want to work want to work within a certain number of miles or hours from my partner. And I want to see each other. I want to see my partner achieve their career goals and really saying that to your to your partner, to your colleague, <laughs> to your partner and saying, you know, I want to be happy in my career, but I also want you to be happy in your career. Being able to say that to your partner will really help you be to strengthen your relationship as you endeavor to deal with this two-body challenge. And then, of course, the side, the, the next thing, of course, the, to the secondary side of this is what do we need as a couple? Okay, are there children involved? Or is there financial issues? Are there housing issues? Are there family issues? Maybe we need, as a couple, to be near my parents. Maybe we need to be within a particular region uh, because of the financial issues associated with that. Uh, maybe we need a two, at least a two bedroom apartment. And knowing to be able to say that what you need it, what, you know, actually able to acknowledge what you need out of this relationship, need out of this as a couple in terms of your what career choices you make is very important because like think about the housing issue. If you have, let's say you have three kids as you and your, you and your partner have three children. Well, if that's the case, you probably need something, need, not want, but need housing that's bigger than a studio apartment. You probably need housing that's bigger than a one-bedroom apartment. You probably need need at least a two-bedroom uh, domicile, an apartment or house of some sort. Well, if that's the case, if that's what you need, well, let's say you want to go, you want to work in San Francisco. You want to work in San Francisco. Well, and you would like to work at the same institution. Well, the realities of working in San Francisco at the same institution are not that high. And depending on, of course, it depends on what you're, you're skilled in and what your degrees are in. But the housing, if that's a need, housing is very expensive in San Francisco. I just recently read that uh, I think an apartment, a studio apartment uh, in San Francisco right now is going for three thousand. The the mean is going for three thousand dollars a month. So if I'm going to have three children, if I'm going to live in San Francisco and work in San Francisco. I need to be able to afford housing for the needs of my family. Well, that's going to require me to be a little bit more open about what else I can do if that's a need. Because I might not necessarily be able to just get a postdoc because a postdoc at $48,000 a year and, and, and then some, that's not going to support a two-bedroom apartment in San Francisco. So I have to be a little bit more realistic about what my needs are and what will actually fill those needs. And we need to know what our limits are and our non-negotiables are within our within the couple, within our partnership, right? So maybe it's a distance issue that we want to be within X miles of each other at any given time. Maybe it's a time issue. We want to be within Y hours of each other, right? So we could potentially take a job. We could potentially live, for example, in Baltimore, and um, you could work in Washington, D.C., and I could work in another part of Maryland or maybe even work in Delaware or something like that. So we're th within y, y hours of each other. Um, maybe it's a time issue. When will you actually see each other? You know, is that a non-negotiable that 
we will see each other every day. That is absolute. That's an absolute need in our relationship. It's not going to be that we see each other every weekend or every other weekend or once a month or twice a year. Or you might be one of those couples who never wants to see your partner. You're thrilled if they live on the other side of the planet. That's like fantastic for you both. <laughs> that's a, not even a want, but it's a need. And if that's the case, good. Mazel tov to you both. I, I encourage you to pursue that. Uh, and being honest about it is really fantastic but but be honest with your both with each other about what it is that you when it is that you want to see each other and why that's a why that's a non-negotiable and then what we're going to do is we're going to do a couple SWOT analysis that's a strengths weaknesses opportunities threats so we're going to look at what are the strengths that we have as a couple and individually in terms of our skill set in terms of our employability what are the weaknesses that we have and the weaknesses are going to be intrinsic. So it could be skills, it could be issues associated with what we want or need out of our careers. Then we're going to look at opportunities that might be appropriate for us as a couple and individually and together. And those opportunities are going to come from your networking and from your research of different career paths and career opportunities and, and, and employers in particular regions and at particular times. And then the threats, the threats are extrinsic as well. So we're going to look at what would be a threat to us pursuing that opportunity. So us getting jobs in San Francisco is fantastic. That's the great thing. But the threat to that is that if we need to be in New Jersey or we need to be in Beijing, that's not necessarily going to be uh, doable. Um, so, well, I mean, I guess it could be you could find a way to see each other every other month or something like that, and that's fine um, but the threat is that you have to be in a particular region or you need to be in a certain place and if the opportunity is in a different region then that's the threat to it so threats not necessarily a negative thing it's something that could derail the opportunity and then we want to think and be clear and write it down what is the impact on each other and the couple of our individual and couple goals of timing issues of financial issues so if we choose to do X if we choose to pursue careers in San Francisco or Beijing at this time what are what's going to be the impact on me what's going to be the impact on you and what's going to be the impact on our, us and then this is also going to require us to expand our search parameters and make contingency plans which identify the worst case scenario that we don't get any jobs or that you get a freaking awesome job and I get not a job at all or I get a job that I that I get another postdoc that's a very short-term postdoc very low paid but you get a freaking awesome job in Beijing what should we do about that that's you know the worst case scenario that could be a worst case scenario I should say but we're going to be flexible honest and know what we can and cannot compromise on important questions to ask are what if I get a job and you don't or what if I get my dream job and you can't find even any job how are we gonna handle this what are we gonna do how are we gonna stay together and work together as a couple on this challenge and if your goal is to be in the same geographic region we're gonna ask ourselves can we both have a career that is satisfying here and that might be thinking outside of traditional boundaries right we might have had our our thoughts wed I might be wedded to the idea of becoming a professor of astrophysics but if we both are going to live in San Francisco maybe there's something else I can do in San Francisco that would be very satisfying to me maybe it'd be working for a tech company maybe it'd be working for a nonprofit or a government agency or a government lab there's a possibility there but I want to see what else is going to help me to be satisfied intellectually and in my career. And likewise, I want you to do the same. And what can we do to make this happen? So we're going to be exploring those non-traditional routes, for example, an industry job for one of you. We might also ask who will be, who could be the trailing spouse, the trailing partner, and when? When is that okay? You know, I've talked to many couples where they have actually made packs with each other where in certain times of their, uh, their evolution as a couple, they have chosen to have one partner to be the trailing spouse, and then they've agreed to flip it in a couple of years when a certain milestone takes place. They've actually built that into their plan, that one will be a trailing spouse for now, and then the other will be a trailing spouse later. So to be able to be honest about that is, is really helpful. But we also want to be thinking about what a realistic time frame would be for a job search before we do go into our contingency plans. Negotiation is very, very important with the two-body challenge. And you know, I just wanted to mention the idea of when to mention your partner, particularly if you're going for a job at a university, let's say, or a 
um, government lab or even a government agency. So oftentimes I get that question, I, you know, I'm in, Elena, I'm in a two-body situation, I have a partner, they, are also, they also have a PhD, and we both would like to work for the same institution. When do we mention, when should I mention, I'm interviewing for the job, when should I mention my partner? And of course there's three phases when you could potentially mention your partner and see if there's an opportunity for him or her to work at the institution that you're interviewing at right now. And that could be during the application phase, so where you both write letters of intent or applications and submit applications and mention each other. It could be during the interview phase where, you know, let's say one of you advances to the interview and you mention it either to the search committee or to the department head or to some other party, maybe the dean, who has the authority power to negotiate for that other person to join the organization, the university, the department. Or it could be during the negotiation phase when you actually are offered the position and then you say to the search committee or you say to the dean or the department head or the, 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 the authority, uh, you know, I wanted to mention I'm really excited about joining your department. Uh, I have a partner who's also a PhD. Um, I wanted to see if there might be an opportunity for him or her to join the department too. Now there's a really great article that's mentioned, you can see the link right there, Solving the Two-Body Problem, written for Science Magazine back in 2003. And this article actually goes into pros and cons of presenting this mentioning your partner at different phases of the interviewing phase of the job search phase and personally I used to think that you only mention it at the negotiation phase only when one of you has been given at least one of you has been given an offer do you mention your partner but then I actually talked with a couple of different people including a department head and I asked him how did you handle this and what would you recommend it and he said that he had somebody who was interviewing for a job uh, in his, as a faculty member in his, in his department she interviewed with the search committee and then when she had a private meeting with him the department head she mentioned that her husband was also a PhD and I think he was a PhD in another area of science, so not in her science, but in another area of science, and she mentioned it privately to the department head and wanted to see if there's an opportunity because she emphasized that she's excited to join this department, uh, and but she wanted to see is there a possibility of finding an opportunity for her husband at the same university. And the department had told me that he was very happy that she brought it up at that time. It did not impact the search committee's decision to hire her because it was a private meeting between him and, and her. And, but it did help him to have time to, to look for resources to potentially help this, this couple. So if the search committee did decide to hire her, he would have been, had opportunity to find the resources to be able to help find a position for this new faculty member in another part of the college, not in his department. And I really thought about that and I thought that, that was a really good idea and I heard similar people say similar things to me. So that's why I think now if you were to bring it up in the interviewing phase that that could be a potential pro for both you and your partner. Um, you do it discreetly, you don't do it as you walk in, you don't do it during your job talk, okay, you don't do it when you uh, stand up and first introduce yourself to the search committee, but you can do it during the private meeting with the department head or with the dean or even both and let them know that you've talked to both of those to see if there's an opportunity. But you emphasize that you're excited about joining the department whether or not you're, uh, especially if it's, an, it's, a, it's a negotiable, you're interested in joining the department and you're excited about joining the university whether or not your partner gets an opportunity here or not. Because if that's the case you could potentially always get uh, start in the negotiation phase, once the offer is extended to you, you could potentially add it and start negotiating for it as well. And I've known many faculty who have done that. They don't mention it until the negotiation phase. This article actually does the pros and cons. I think it's very relevant. And there was another really interesting article that I read about, um, or I actually I think I interviewed this couple. They were both biologists in the same subfield. And what they did was they mentioned each other during the application phase. They, they both wrote letters of intent to apply for a faculty position, but what they did was they offered to split the faculty line. And they said, we want to, well, you know, our goal is to work in the same institution. We have something that's very valuable together and individually. This is what we could provide you if we join your department. We'd split the faculty line. We'd share an office. We'd, but we'd bring in double the money because they'd still continue to apply for grants. We'd still be teaching individually, so they would have double the teaching load. 
but they would be able to both be in the same department at the same time. And really their goal, their couple goal, was to be able to be have at least one parent home with their kid at any given time. That was their couple need. And because they were able to verbalize that to each other, they were able to think creatively how they could actually manifest that in a career opportunity. They offered to split the faculty line. The department said that's interesting. And ultimately, they both got the job, and they did do that. They split the faculty line. So now we've come to the end of our webinar today. And now I want to really give you one more high five, one more just really big notion to plant in your brain to remember who you are. The most important thing when dealing with any type of challenge, whether it's a happy challenge, like what can we as a partner, as, a, as two partners do together, or dealing with a negative challenge such as a layoff or a, a zombie boss, is to remember the facts, to remember the data, remember who you are. You are talented, you are smart, you are amazing, you are creative, you are a hard worker, you have high values, that's who you are. And yes, you're facing a challenge right now, but that challenge does not define you. You define how you manage that challenge. And the way we're going to manage any challenge is we're going to plan in advance for contingencies because you will face multiple challenges in your life. I don't, I don't even know what the next challenge will be for me personally, but I will face many more challenges in my life. And every challenge I have, just like me running up that hill, I thank, I thank myself for being able to, to deal with this challenge, to have this challenge in front of me so that I can get stronger, so that I'm training for my next challenge. So I'm going to appreciate those challenges. And then the next thing that I'm going to do, and the next thing that you're going to do, is you're going to pay it forward. You're going to become a challenge agent within your field, within your organization, within your profession. You're going to support people who are facing challenges. You're going to look for opportunities for them to be successful, for them to be safe is as they work through a challenge, as they embrace a challenge, and as they move past a challenge. And you're going to ensure that your profession maintains its highest standards as much as possible. When you become a challenge agent for yourself and your team and your profession, you change the world. And that's the capacity that you have, and that's what you have at your at your, uh, that's what you have in terms of what's in front of you. So with that, I want to thank you so much. These are a few resources. This webinar has been recorded and you will be able to access it very soon. I'll be sending you the link for it. Um, I hope you'll take a look at some of these resources that we have available to you. Of course, we have a survey and we hope you will fill out the survey and let us know what we can do better, how we can improve, what challenges we face and how we can improve upon them. And Please stay in touch. Connect with me on LinkedIn. Join my LinkedIn group, Elena's Alumni. Follow me on Twitter. Let me know how I can help you and how I can help you face your next challenge. But always remember who you are. You are amazing. You are talented. You are brilliant. And I cannot sit, wait to see what you will do next when life gives you a challenge. Go forward. Enjoy your successes. And enjoy your career adventures. Thank you so much, everybody. This concludes the webinar for today, but I'm going to stick around and answer any questions. Thank you so much.